Welcome to the Cloud English Podcast. My name is Luke, and it's great to be here. It is October 1st, 2097, and it's a sunny day. It's autumn. It's, uh, I think it's autumn, yeah. When does autumn start? Sep end of September, right? Uh, September 21st, is that right? I can't, yeah, I think that's right. It's autumn. It's getting a little cool here in New York. And I hope you're having a fantastic week or weekend or whatever it is, wherever you are. Thanks for joining. Today we're talking about advice. And we're going to be covering that from a couple different angles. We're going to talk a little bit about English listening skills. We're going to be learning some phrases, some English phrases that you can use to give advice in different ways and to respond to that advice as well because you need to know how to respond to advice. We'll talk a little bit about well i have a i have a personal recommendation based on something that's going on recently for me uh around books for kids uh so if you, you know, have little kids and you want to share some english books with them or you may and you want to give them some exposure to english what are the books maybe to start with and so we'll talk a little bit about that i have a personal recommendation there okay and some other things as well. Um, those joining live, thank you for joining live. If you have any questions, let me know in the chat. If you haven't done so already and you enjoy these, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe. It's a little thing that you can do, especially hitting the like button, which shows the algorithm that you approve of what's happening here and you want other people to see it, right? So that simple action. Hit the like button, subscribe, and also you can get a free course, Natural English Conversations, that's in the links in the description. It should be the first link, so check that out. That's a free course. If you want to get more in-depth on my courses, you can check those out too. And I recently added four new courses to the yearly membership, the monthly membership too, at no additional cost. So... What I did was I added um, a course on, which ones did I add? The grammar course, the pro a pronunciation course, and a, what else did I add? Um, what did I add? I, I added four, four new courses. So check that out. Lots of new content. If you are a member on the site, you can access it immediately. If not, you can get a 30% discount on the yearly membership that's every single month 30 percent discount so grab that as well in the links in the description let's see what else what else oh yeah if you're listening thank you for listening but if you'd like to watch you can do so on youtube and facebook if you're watching if you want to listen sometimes you want you know you're mowing the grass or you're walking your turkey or whatever it may be you know listen links in the description there are plenty of places to listen spotify apple podcasts google podcasts anchor all of those places all right okay all right so let's get cracking shall we I hear a cat meowing but i don't know where it's coming from I hear a baby crying but i don't know where it's coming from there are a lot of noises happening now uh, okay, so let's get started. I think we can get started. After some coffee, of course, I skipped last week. Some stuff came up. I'm trying to be very regular and consistent, but sometimes, you know, things come up. Um, but I, I, I'm finding, I think, a good rhythm with the um, Sunday morning time. So I'm, I'm looking at that being the regular... The regular time for the live, um, the live recordings, but we'll see how it goes. You know how it is with a new with a new baby. What I found with having a baby is that a lot of people have advice, and I think that's good. I like to hear the advice. I love the advice. But what I also noticed is sometimes you should take that advice and apply it because it's useful, and sometimes you need to know I think when to not, just to ignore it. And so finding that balance of, okay, which, which advice is good and which advice should I ignore is an interesting challenge in and of itself. Okay, so let's get into listening. So 
one problem that many English learners have is listening. Now, it's for many different reasons. To be clear, if you struggle with listening, it may be simply that you're not able to hear precisely the sounds that native English speakers are making when they're speaking because you haven't trained your ear enough, right? So they may be talking, they may be talking very fast, you missed something, and now you're kind of lost and you don't know what they're saying. Okay, that's one reason. That's one reason. But that's, to be very clear, not the only reason. You can have someone who's speaking very slowly, very clearly, enunciating every word extremely well, like this, and still you don't understand. Why is that? Perhaps because of cultural references. You don't know the reference that was made because you didn't grow up in that native environment, and so you miss it, right? Maybe it's an idiom, maybe it's a phrase, maybe it's a reference to some other thing in the culture. Okay, that's one reason, but that's not it. Sometimes it's fitting the pieces together. So you hear all the words, but maybe this whole group of words, perhaps it's a phrase, or maybe it's a grammatical chunk, just doesn't quite make sense. So I, I don't want to get into all of the reasons why, because I want to give you advice for what to do if you want to improve your English listening. But I just want to say very clearly, it's not because native English speakers are talking too fast. That is one of many reasons why your listening is not as good as you want it to be, okay? So what can you do? That's what I want to focus on. What can you do to be a better English listener, comprehend more? I think one thing that's very important, that's so obvious, but I have to say it, right, is to have consistent immersion. And this is, I think, something that you probably instinctively know, but you don't follow up on it, perhaps, enough, right? Because it's just more comfortable to live in your language environment, right? But if you want to get serious, you have to start building out that English brain and start building out that English environment for yourself. And part of that is that you're fully immersed. You have sources of stuff that you hear on a regular basis. And that regular basis is the other key, that it is consistent, right? If you get excited about improving your English and then you do it for a week and give up, you're like, you know, me, when I sign up for a gym membership, I'm going to go to the gym. I do it for two weeks and then I stop. <laughs> I start to feel guilty because I'm not going, but I'm paying to go, right? This is not good. Actually, recently, I've been very good with it. But I, in the past, in my life, I have been guilty of, of the, the gym syndrome, we could call it. So that means you have to find stuff that you like because that will make you want to do it, right? You like listening to this podcast, this podcast, this YouTuber, this type of audiobook, you find the topic of this audiobook fascinating, right? I love learning about, or I love listening to novels about, right? Whatever it is, whether it's TV shows, videos, audiobooks, YouTube channels, podcasts, I don't care. It's all good. Find what you like, and then make it so that you don't have to have that feeling of, Oh, here we go. I have to do this. Because if you can get into a place where you love listening to that and you want to do it, you're not going to give up. You're going to be very consistent and you're going to have that language environment, that immersion that you want. Yes, you're not going to understand everything, but you're going to start picking up stuff and hearing words and phrases a couple times and the third or fourth time you hear it, you'll say, oh yeah, that, that. I heard that a few other times. What is that? Then you look it up and you learn it. And you remember it because you heard it in context. This is very important. And again, very important to actually enjoy it. Because if you don't, you're probably going to give up. Okay? So that's number one. Number two, it's very important in some way or in several ways to participate 
in what you are consuming. Again, we're talking about listening here, okay? So if you want to pick up more stuff, you can listen passively to a podcast, but uh, you know, you're doing other things, maybe you're, you're not really getting that much, it's still having the environment that's good. But if you really wanna start getting stuff out of it, you have to participate in some way. And by participate, I don't mean you're watching a video and you're leaving a comment. Yeah, sure, if you want to. What I mean by participate is mentally participate in it. And this is something that I work on very seriously when I listen to audiobooks, which I really like to do. I will participate in listening. And that is an activity where you ask yourself questions as you're listening. You repeat things in your mind that are important. Now, some people like to take notes. Sure, that, that, that counts too, right? Taking notes when you're listening. But if that's too boring or high stress, okay, you're listening to an audiobook. After you finish one chapter, just sort of stop and think about, okay, what are my main takeaways? Did I pick out any interesting words? Did I hear anything that I want to remember? And just think about it for a while. And I do this all the time. I like to ask myself questions about what I just heard. And just asking myself a couple of questions about what I just heard, and then kind of answering those questions for myself, not even out loud, allows me to retain much more of what I listen to. It's actually very powerful, right? So I strongly recommend participating. Now that could, if you want to go in more depth, be a summaries. Again, you can write and take notes. Uh, you can work on your mind palace and go very slowly and pick out specific things that you're hearing and store those in your, your mind or memory palace, right? You can, you can speak summaries, do voice dictation. There are a lot of ways to do more in, intense practice. I'm just saying find some way to participate rather than just purely listening passively. Okay, so these first two are more the immersive type and the ongoing type and the less intense way of improving. But what about that intense way? What if you want to really intensely work on that? And you, you may have heard me say this already, but that is, it's a very simple exercise. Very simple. You take a very challenging short clip of audio perhaps from a news broadcast or a section of a video or somewhere. It should be very difficult. It should be very challenging. Maybe it's only one minute long. Maybe it's only 45 seconds long, whatever. And you have a way to listen to it on repeat, okay? So this is up to you to figure out how to do. It's not that hard if you, if you know how to do that, but it you gotta figure it out. Okay, so you have this 45 second to one minute clip of audio. And you say to yourself, I will transcribe this. Now, transcription is when you turn something that is heard into text. You may have heard transcription. Maybe your, your, your phone has an app for transcription, uh, right? So you are the transcriber. You're the one taking what you hear and turning it into written text. So you're sitting down at a desk or a table or on the floor or next to a cow, or whatever you want. You, you have a notebook, or your computer, or your phone, or whatever. <laughs> the, free, the details are less important. You have some way to write something down, and you're listening to this on repeat, and you have to write down every word. Now, will you be able to do that the first time? No. Second time? If you can the first time, it's too easy, right? Second time? No. Third time? No. Fourth time? No. Fifth time? But each time you're making a little bit of progress and what you start to notice is there may be a few gaps where you simply cannot hear what is said. I don't know what is here. It's a gap for me. But because you're slowly filling out 70, 80% of it, right, as you're writing, as you're listening again and again, you have to use clues, what does it sound like, to maybe do some side research, to try to think about what has to be here grammatically, right? Well, it has to be was rather than is, because I know that this person is talking about something in the past, so even though I can't hear, it is very 
or it was very, I know that it has to be it was very, then it is very, simply because grammatically it wouldn't make sense for it to be it is. So it has to be it was, even though I can't actually make myself hear was, I can't hear it, I can't force my ear to hear that. It was very, it was very, it was very, maybe someone says, is there, is there, well, yeah. It doesn't sound like it is very or it was very. It is very, is very, is very, right? Sometimes native English speakers, they mush their words together. So there you have to use your knowledge of grammar, your understanding of grammar. So you're putting, you're using all the tools to put this transcription together. It's very intense. It's very boring, but it is a great way to improve your ability to pick up things and infer accurately about what you cannot hear because listening is not is not very, to be very clear it is not all about listening it is about understanding and your ears are the tools that pick up the sounds but your brain is the tool that puts it all together and sometimes sounds are simply not there but a native english speaker doesn't need all the sounds because their brain puts it together very well because they know the patterns of the language so that's what you need to get better at, and this is a good way to do it. It's very intensive, very difficult, but very, very powerful, very useful. Okay, two more. What about getting used to one accent? Oh, you say, I really like the way that this person talks or that person talks. Great. You know, I sometimes hear that for my courses. Luke, I don't think, you know, this... 15 hour course. I like how you talk. So it's okay. It's good. I, I enjoyed the course. But if I didn't like how you talked, having to look at you and listen to you for 15 hours would be terrible. And I agree. I have refunded many audiobooks because of how people talk. If you just don't like how someone talks, it's very annoying. I one time had a professor in a class and, uh, it was the first class, I think it was a religious studies class, this is a total side point, but he made a weird noise in his throat. I went to the first class, and I don't remember what the noise was, but it bothered me. And so after the class, I left and I dropped the class and changed to something else. I think I changed to horseback riding or something like that, because I couldn't stand how he talked. Anyway, side point. But, but my main point here is, you can't just do here. You can't just expose yourself to what you enjoy listening to all the time because you might get too comfortable with one way of speaking. You need variety. So this, this tip is to push yourself to continue to expand American pronunciation, British pronunciation, but not just accents, right? Types of media news broadcasts, TV shows with a lot of dialogue, reality shows, podcasts, all different types. The more variety, the better. It's actually not better to have one type of thing that you listen to. It's better to have more variety. So continue to push yourself to have more variety in the things that you consume. That's very important. Finally, I want you to try to bring some objective measurement to your listening if you can. This is not a requirement, but if you can find a way to measure your listening comprehension skills, then you're going to be able to actually track your progress because it's so subjective. If you feel, I feel I'm getting better, then maybe one day you're just in a good mood so you feel you're getting better, and the next day you're not in a good mood so you feel you're not and you get discouraged. When actually you didn't get better at all, or you did or you didn't, uh, it's just, it's, it's hard to measure. But there is a way to measure it. There are online exams you can take. There are comprehension tests. Some are free, some you have to pay for. But some of the ones you have to pay for are fairly reasonable. Something like the Duolingo English test, right? Or maybe the IELTS progress check, so it's not the full IELTS exam. But the IELTS progress check, you, you have to pay for it, but it can give you a pretty accurate sense for actually not just your listening. Your listening, 
your uh, general speaking abilities, written skills, right? So some of these online evaluation tools can actually be a good way to get some objective measurement of where you are. So that maybe once a year even, you check your listening comprehension and you can see, oh, I didn't feel like I got better, but I can see I actually got better. Because another thing that happens is as people improve, sometimes they don't have self-confidence and they say, I'm not good, I'm terrible. Actually, they're improving a lot, but their attitude prevents them from feeling like they are. So put your feelings aside, objectively measure your progress and you see, oh, what? Even though I don't feel like I'm getting better, clearly I am because there's the score. I'm getting better or <laughs> I'm getting worse or whatever, right? I need to change maybe how I practice because <laughs> I didn't get better at all. So what I'd like you to do just in general is build a plan for yourself about how you're going to improve in the areas of your English listening that you need to improve in most. Think about what we've talked about, objective measurement variety, having variety, doing something very intensive like the transcription exercise, participation in what you listen to casually, and having that constant, consistent, regular immersion in sources that you actually enjoy, okay? Let me know what your goals are. I would love to see them. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. And also, get a free course, Natural English Conversations, that is in the links in the description. Sure, Emma, no problem. Okay, we have some people joining. That's fantastic. People joining live. Denise is here from Sao Paulo. Oh, great. Self-talk, um, that's a little different. Self-talk is a little different. Self-thought, maybe I don't know what to call it. So, so what I do when I'm listening to an audiobook. Right now, I'm listening to an audiobook called The Road to Eleusis, which is a fascinating, a fascinating book. It's an audiobook called The Road to Eleusis. And it's about how, it's about the Eleusinian mysteries, which were, it was a mystery, um, uh, kind of religious ceremony, cult thing that happened uh, in ancient Greece, and uh, it's based on the myth of Demeter and Persephone, and so I want to retain as much of that as I can, so I might ask myself questions, I was driving, I was listening to it in the car, I might ask myself questions about it as I'm listening, right? So, okay, what's the, what is the name of the compound that um, th that they used in the in the ritual, uh, ergot, which ergot? Ergot of barley. Well, are there, are there other ergots? Yeah, there's ergot of corn and ergot of rye and ergot of barley. They used ergot of barley. Why is it ergot of barley? Because on the the many of the uh, symbols that they used in as part of the ritual and around the uh, the site. Uh, they had a a barley leaf. I think it's called a leaf or a barley whatever. Barley, what is it, a leaf? <laughs> a barley plant. They had a barley plant as a symbol. Okay, so I remember that. Okay, now what's the drink called? What's the, they had this, this uh, crazy hallucinogenic drink that they would drink and then they would see this vision. The drink is called the kekyan. Okay, so the drink is called the kekyan, and this is the thing that has the different ingredients. It's got mint, it's got barley, it's got uh, water, and it's got, oh, I forget the other ingredient. But I wasn't trying to remember that, so that's okay. But it's called the kekyan, right? Okay, so I can remember that. So I'm, as I'm listening, I'm kind of asking myself these questions, and I may pause it for, for a little while and just kind of ask myself these little questions uh, to remember or process it. And just doing that, you're kind of poking into something that could otherwise be simply passive, right? Uh, and making it a little more active. And when you make it a little more active, you increase your retention just as a casual way of listening. I still feel it's pretty casual. I do. I just do it by habit at this point but it helps me retain more. And I don't remember everything, certainly. I don't remember everything, but I try to at least remember some of the 
some of the key things. Okay, what is the myth that this is based on? It's the myth of Demeter and Persephone, uh, where, and then they tell the story, and I try to remember kind of what happened and why that's relevant to this, to the ritual at Eleusis, and, uh, yeah, just to try to put it together in my mind, I'm kind of creating an object as I listen, rather than just letting it float through me, so it really helps me, and I, I, I can, uh, I can I can uh, recommend it. Mary McCain is here. Oh, hello, hi, hi, hip, hip, hooray! Do you have any live podcast? This is a live podcast. <laughs> You're literally here for it at the moment. That's like saying that's like looking at a clown who's dressed as a clown with a clown nose and clown hair, saying, "Do you know where I can find any clowns?" <laughs> Unless I misunderstood your question. That's funny. Uh, yeah. It's like hey, taking a sip of coffee and going, ah, man, I'd love a cup of coffee right now. I wish I, I wish I had one. Dang it. Oh, different. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I, I, I misunderstood. APH, sorry. Uh, you mean recommend any podcast? So, you mean, did I do any podcasts or recommending podcasts done by others? That's what I wonder if your question is podcasts I like to listen to or podcasts that I've done. I've only done one other podcast. Uh, and it, it is a podcast that I did with uh, a friend. I did some with my brother too, but it, the podcast is called, we just started it and we did it for a little while and then we kind of stopped. Um, we kind of just got busy and stopped doing it, but we did quite a few episodes. Let me see how many episodes we did. The podcast is called The Fractal, The Fractal, and you probably can't even search it. So, so it's, we just started and kind of stopped. Uh, let's see, search by filter type search by channel okay there it is it pops up if you search by channel it pops up so it's a it was a movie not movie reviews but we would watch a movie not in the podcast but we would watch a movie and then we would discuss the symbols and the, the philosophy generally symbolism mythology philosophy psychology discussions with uh, one of my good friends. Generally, that's that was the focus. So we did um, Donnie Darko, Ex Machina, Blade Runner 2049, Eternal Sunshine, uh, Annihilation, The Tree of Life, Enemy, Her, and Joker. And we also did True Detective, the whole first season of True Detective. It was fun. We might get back to it someday, but I don't. I, I don't know. Ah, yeah, so check that out if you like. Luke, have you built a mighty mental palace hanging out with myths and cetera? Yeah, pre yeah, I ha Oh, Luke, you have built. Yes, I have. You're right. Mary McCain, I have. But it's mine, and it's mine alone. Um, but I recommend it as a good way to interact with stuff that you consume. <clears throat> whether that be books or words, idioms, phrases, whatever. I try to build out individual spaces for each category of things, right? So I have a, I have a space for, generally I have a space for early Christianity. The first 400 years of Christian history. And the things that happened there, I have a space for that, which includes a lot of terms, people, and dates. I just want to remember the terms, the people, and the dates. I don't usually need to remember the thing associated with the term, the person, or the date. Because once I recall the term, the person, and the date, it sort of unfolds itself. And I can almost see it unfold, and I just remember the thing associated with the term, the person, and the date, 
right? Um, that's how it works for me anyway. So I'll store the term, the person, and the date in that particular landscape associated with early Christian history, and I will style it. So it'll have a certain animation style or a certain design language. Some of my spaces are, for example, very simple shapes or simple objects. Some of them are in a particular style of a partic particular anime TV series, because each one usually has a different style, uh, or a particular type of painting. So they have a different look, and that is a thumbprint that allows me to click into that space or another space. So it's like having a bunch of rooms in a space, and the thumbprint is the style and once you step into that place, you're in that style, you know everything is associated with this category. Let's say, for example, early Christian history or, or whatever, whatever topic it is. I generally group by topic rather than specific dates. So while the, the example of early Christian history would be around specific dates, I try to keep it topic-based rather than date range-based, right? Uh, and there are different ways to store things. Sometimes for certain things you want to choose a mnemonic. And a mnemonic is where you make an association with a thing based on something that it reminds you of, usually a sound, right? So it sounds like this. And so when you think of that, you think of that sound and then you make the, those two things are forever linked together, basically. Um, and you can do that with people's names or faces or, 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 or whatever. But it's sort of an association between a sounds like or perhaps a looks like. But mnemonic would be a sounds like and that thing that you're trying to remember. And you want to make it kind of weird or strange if you can. But then the other one is called, um, and it's a variation of what's called the major system. And the major system is a way to remember particularly numbers. Numbers would be associated with a letter, and then you would, what you do is every number, equal because numbers are hard to remember. If I say, okay, remember the number 5831, okay? How, so if, you, if I say, remember 5831, okay, now remember that forever. If you really care about it, and there's a lot of pressure to remember that, you may. But what if I say 5831222287, right? If I make it longer than a few digits like 7, it becomes very difficult. Because our brains are not very good at processing that kind of information. We're not very good at remembering raw numbers. But we are very, very good at remembering visual things. And we're very good at remembering events. If an event stands out to you in your mind, you're, you're very good at remembering kind of the, the timeline of what happened. So for the major system, what you do is you code each number into a letter of the alphabet. The major system does it in a particular way. I kind of have my own system for doing it. So one is T and two is Z or N, because of how it looks, right? Three is M or W, because again, of how it looks, right? Four, of course, that's H, right? Five is S. Six is G. Seven is L. Eight is B. And nine is P, okay? So that's what you're working with. And then you go, you, if you have a number, whether it's 10 digits or 100 digits, all you do is you go through and you create a sequence of words using the letters that you have. So you turn all of the numbers into letters and then you turn the letters into words. If you can have a big word, right, then, for example, let's say 355, what would that be? And by the way, vowels don't count, so that's how you make the words. So 355 would probably be the word miss, right? Because three is M, M is three, and five, five, that's S, S. And I know I is in there, so miss, okay? And so I could build that into 
a, a series of events in my imagination that could either be a, a miss, as in a person, a, a, a young woman in a shop, perhaps, or perhaps an arrow missing a target. Either way, as long as that word is there, when I go through the story and the sequence of events, and it has to be pretty memorable, when I get to that point, I see miss, then I have to just convert that that miss back into numbers. So as I'm going through, the miss, okay, so then I code that back in 2355. Five. So that's how it works. That's the major system. And the more you practice it, the faster, the faster you get. And you combine mnemonic mnemonics and the images called loci with the major system for the dates, and you place the objects, the mnemonic objects beside or around the dates inside of this landscape that has a thumbprint and boom you've got your memory palace and that's how it goes <sighs> too much explanation of that perhaps anyway 10 15 p.m says emma it is 11 47 a.m here 11 45 a.m yeah 40 yeah 45 47 whatever hello mega hello hello brenda hello Mary says, I have decided to befriend my own gut instincts and intuitive senses. It's spot on, and I'd hang out there. Uh, <laughs> that's my no one else there. Yeah, I think I that's great. I think, I think, yeah, listening to your intuition, listening to your gut, rarely goes wrong. I agree with that. I agree with that. But sometimes it's confusing when you think something is your gut, but it, but you just decided that that was your gut. And actually, it's not. And it can get confusing. But that's cool. I won't try to en encroach on your gut space. All right. Hello. Welcome. We're going to move on. Friendly friends, neighbors, citizens. I would be curious if anyone decides to build a memory palace for learning English, how it works, how it goes. I have one for English too, actually. I have a list of 900 words that I'm learning and uh, I'm storing it in my memory palace and uh, it's fun. I really like it. It's so relaxing. I enjoy it so much. Okay, what's what's up next? Oh, right. Now I remember. One sec, one sec. Okay. You may or may not know that recently my son Pi was born. And so when your kids are born, you got to figure out what to teach them, right? how they should learn stuff and what they should learn. So I thought about my own childhood, which I think was pretty good. I think I had a pretty good childhood. I got a lot of uh, individualized learning. I got to explore and be curious. It was, it was great. And when I was thinking about it, one of the things that popped up on the question of what I read early on was Dr. Seuss. Now, why Dr. Seuss? What stuck out to me about that? For me, it was the patterns that Dr. Seuss books bring up and the rhythms, the tempo that you get when you read Dr. Seuss books. If you don't know what I mean, I'm talking about books like Hop on Pop. And I'm sorry, it's a little keyed out here because it's green. Or the classic, perhaps one of the best books of all time, Green Eggs and Ham, a classic. And another really good one, Fox in Socks, a classic. And I bought these to read to my son. He's too young to really process it, obviously. He's a, he's a tiny baby. But I wanted to find something that would, in addition to the high contrast baby books that I'm showing to him so that he can start to develop his object recognition skills, I wanted to give him something that, 
that would give him at least some exposure to not the meaning of the English language, but the feeling of it and how it can be playful and flow and rhyme and how when we speak, the voice goes, ah, ah, and it's, it is, it, it, there's a lot of flexibility when you speak, I suppose, any language, but I'm speaking specifically of English. And I think it's a good choice for teaching kids or giving them exposure to that side of the language. Because when we think of language, we often think of words and what they mean. And here's the word that you need to know. And here's how it fits together in grammar, you know, or in a story, this is the message of the story. Or, uh, you know, th th these, these are the characters and this is a description of a tree or whatever. No, this is more about the playful side of the language, with, which I think is very important to build up someone's ability to have that feel for the language. I think I was very strongly impacted by Dr. Seuss books, and I'll read you some a little bit in, in a moment. But it then got me thinking about, okay, well, is this just, you know, my opinion? Or are there other people out there who have the same the same opinion uh, is there are there any studies right do people do people actually look into this stuff and try to see you know which which books help kids more or less right and what i found was actually very interesting there haven't been any sort of serious in-depth studies specifically on dr seuss that i could find but a lot of People, reputable people who are thinking about this in early childhood development said a lot of the things, or at least from what I saw, said a lot of the things that I tend to feel and agree with naturally about when it comes to Dr. Seuss. The rhyme and the rhythm, getting a sense for the inflection, the basic structure of the language, the grammatical structure, because a lot of the words in these books are silly, meaningless, uh, you know, a, a zug is not a real word, but if you say a zug under the rug, then you're learning zug under the rug. That is a grammatical construction using prepositions to place one thing under another thing, right? So that's also very, uh, very important for, for getting a feel for the grammar. The, the, elasticity or flexibility of the vocabulary itself. We make up words all the time. Shakespeare made up a bunch of words and phrases that we use today. Language is very flexible and plastic, and that's a, it's a good way to realize that, hey, maybe I just make up a word. Uh, sometimes you want to express yourself and you can't find the right word, so just figure out something. And I think it's a great way to build a, a model in your head of language being this flexible thing that you use to communicate what you feel and what you think and what you want to say, rather than, I receive language and I use it according to the rules, right? I don't do that. When I'm trying to express something, I'm trying to find the best way to say what I want to say, rather than I'm trying to say everything according to the rules. I happen to follow the rules most of the time, but when I need to break the rules, I know how and when to do that. I think the other part of that is just creativity, I think, especially, I want my son to have a sense for not just, you know, Tom and Mary went to the store and bought some bananas, but some stuff that's completely out there. Concepts like green eggs and ham have stuck with me to this day. I read green eggs and ham as a kid, and the, the, the stuff is still in my head. And when I read it, to my son, I hadn't read it in, I don't know how many years, a hundred years, however many years it's been. It was fresh. It was, it's been there the whole time. So, uh, and, and I feel like there's been an influence of that on my ability to be creative and be imaginative. The, the idea of having green eggs and ham and that, and the, the, the tension in the green eggs and ham. I'll read a little bit of that again in a second. And also it's very funny. So I think also, my opinion here, humor is a very big part of life. I, I think so. And introducing humor, I don't want 
I think it's important to read serious books. I read my son these contrast books, and it's really like, Hello, Mr. Turtle. Nice shell. Uh, I like your flippers. Hello, Mr. Zebra. You know, very simple stuff, which is good. You need that grounding in reality. But I think also introducing the funny side of life and humor and some darkness and the that, that developing that sense, I think, is very important. And that's one thing that I really like about, about Dr. Seuss. The Zug Under the Rug. I remember very clearly from my childhood this this uh, is kind of funny, but also a little bit scary. There's this thing under a rug and you, it's just a shape. And that kind of scared me as a kid, but also it activated my imagination. And it's it's kind of funny that there's this just this weird thing under these kids rug. It's 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 a it's a bizarre type of humor that that Dr. Seuss had. So let's um, let me grab green eggs and ham and I'm just going to read a very short excerpt of it green eggs and ham a classic it, these are green eggs these are invisible invisible eggs and ham right but uh, okay so I'll just read a section of this would you eat oh let me move them a let me go a little later so so this guy Sam <laughs> This guy, Sam, he's a psycho. He is obsessed with getting this other guy to eat to try green eggs and ham. I mean, he's extending it. I apologize for the green screen, but he's extending it on this ridiculous arm on a plate trying to get him to eat it. And he just doesn't want to eat it. And his approach, is, which is a hilarious approach, is rather than saying, OK, so you don't want to try green eggs and ham. First of all, why is he obsessed with this? <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny by itself. It's just, it's funny. Um, he then he then thinks it's a good idea to maybe he'll want to try it in a bunch of different settings. Okay, you don't want it, but would you eat it with a mouse? Would you eat it in a house? That's funny, I think. And he keeps pushing this until he finally just gives up. It says, "All right, fine. You know what? If you leave me alone, I will. I'll eat it." I'll try it, okay? Just leave me alone. And he tries it, and guess what? He loves it. Spoiler alert. So I'll just read a, a little excerpt here of this, a uh, very short excerpt of, of this because it's funny. Say, in the dark? Here in the dark? Would you? Could you? In the dark? Then the response is, I would not, could not, in the dark. Would you? Could you? In the rain, they come out of the cave into the rain, so they're on a train. They were in the dark, and now they're outside in the rain. I would not, could not in the rain, not in the dark, not on a train, not in a car, not in a tree. I do not like them, Sam, you see. Not in a house, not in a box, not with a mouse, not with a fox. I do not eat them here or there. I'm sorry, I will not eat them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. You do not like green eggs and ham? I do not like them, Sam, I am. That's his name, Sam I Am. And then his next question is rather than, okay, you've said many times you don't like them, you know, all right, fair enough, I'll leave you alone. No. His next, after that, after all of that, I would not eat them, you know, I would not eat them in a box, not with a mouse, not with a fox. And then he says, you do not like green eggs and ham? Very clearly, he says, I do not like them, Sam I Am. Without skipping a beat, Sam I Am then says, <laughs> Could you, would you, with a goat? <laughs> then suddenly there's a goat in the car. And uh, now he has to deal with this. I would not, could not, with a goat. Would you, could you, on a boat? And now they're falling uh, off of this train onto a boat in the water. The goat is falling. The fox is falling. It's just chaos. Anyway, and finally, you know, he just, he's so defeated. He's so defeated, he just gives up, you know. And uh, that it's, it, there's a perfect balance there between playful language and uh, it, it, I, I really enjoy, enjoy reading them. Uh, let's see. There is another one that I wanted to share, kind of the creepy side, because there is a slightly, 
there's a slightly creepy side to it as well. The creepy side, I'm just looking back and forth here because I've got, uh, you know, I've got several books in a, in a case. The slightly creepy side is also interesting. Uh, you know, how do you introduce the darkness of life to your kids? Because that's part of life. You don't want to scare them, obviously, but, you know, it is there. So how do you do that? And I think it's a good way to do that, too, rather than, you know, letting them play violent video games. Introduce things like this. Now, again, if there's a green screen effect here, but look at that thing. It's just it's terrifying. Look at his face. It's so scary. He's got weird tusks, weird flippers, and these kids are carrying it into the house. And they say... Look what we found in the park, in the dark. We will take him home. We will call him Clark. <laughs> he will live at our house. He will grow and grow. Will our mother like this? We don't know. <laughs> so these kids have gone rogue, and, and they've found this bizarre creature with Tusk, named, and they've called him Clark, and now they're taking him home, and they don't know what their mom will think. I'm sorry, that's very funny. So, anyway, if you've got kids or you will or you want to just get a feeling for what a lot of kids in America are or used to be, maybe are, I guess it's still popular, get exposed to linguistically, Dr. Seuss is a very good choice. That's my personal recommendation I think it's funny. I think it's great for kids' imagination. I think it's great for getting the sense of the rhythm and the timing of language. So let me know if you do how it goes. If you read them to your kids, it's also going to push you to learn that rhyme scheme and learn that flexibility of pronunciation. So it might help you practice your speaking skills as well. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. And also get a free course, Natural English Conversations, in the links in the the description. Has anyone read Dr. Seuss? Luke, do you consult uh, your wife on how to teach him often? Uh, are you a teacher? I thought uh, you, she'd trust your way. Yeah, we talk about it. We both talk about it. Um, uh, we sh So the way we do it, and I've talked about this before, is she's Chinese. So she's focusing more on the Chinese side and I'm focusing more on the English side. So when it comes to books to read him, I will be choosing, probably choosing most of those. She kind of leaves that up to me. And when it comes to Chinese books that she reads to him, she's bought a bunch of them already and she reads those books to him. You know, he's a tiny baby. How much is he processing of this? Probably not much. The only books that I can say he's really clearly understanding somewhat are the high contrast books. So these are books that have very clear black and white shapes or very stark contrast animals with black backgrounds because I can see that he's looking at them. And when I move the book around, he's looking at them and he has different reactions to different ones. He likes to see the owl he, he, you know, the, the zebra is less interesting to him. And I can see that on, on his face. So I can see there's at least something going on there. When I read him, Dr. Seuss, I, you know, he's too young to, to have an interesting reaction, I think. Uh, he's just sitting there. But, but he's getting exposure. This is building up the linguistic environment. Uh, at least that's, that's the plan. That's the plan. Brenda says, child psychology is a branch of psychology that focuses on the mind and behavior of children from prenatal development through adolescence. Yes, it details not only how tr children grow physically, but also seeks to better understand their mental, emotional, and social development as well. Yeah, sure. The study of child psychology encompasses a wide range of topics from the generic influences on behavior to the social pressures on development. Yeah. Couldn't agree more with all of that stuff that you just said. Is that ChatGPT? Reading books to children is a great way to help them develop. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. <clears throat>
Brenda, are you using ChatGPT or are you writing that yourself? That's my question. <clears throat> the Cat in the Hat is also a classic one, but I haven't read that one yet because it's kind of it's kind of high level. I feel like it's a little bit too difficult. I don't know. Look at me, look at me now, said the cat with a cup and a cake on the top of my hat. I can hold up two books. I can hold up the fish and a little toy ship and some milk on a dish. And look, I can hop up and down on the ball, but that's not all. Oh, no, that's not all. Yeah. The cat is out of control. He's a lunatic. All right. What else we got? Oh, yeah. I wanted to talk about uh, a device. We're going to talk about how to how to give advice. Would you, could you give advice in the dark? I would not, could not in the dark. Not in a park. Not with a zark. Not in a canoe. <clears throat> Not in a shoe. Okay. <clears throat> no other questions. Let's move on. Moving right along, folks. Okay. Let's talk about some simple ways to give advice and recommendations. How can we do this in a very polite way? And how can we do this if we want to be, let's say, a little bit more direct? Not necessarily pushy or rude, but a little bit more direct. So let's, let's get right into, first, how we can do this politely. So polite, respectful advice, okay? Have you considered? When you say, have you considered, it's like holding up an object to them and saying, did you think about this? And then they may say no or yes. And the feeling is no pressure. If you didn't, that's fine. It's a very gentle way to give someone a suggestion, right? And it leaves a lot of room for the person listening to you give advice to maybe say, mm, that's interesting, let me think about that and not answer you right now, right? Oh, I haven't thought about that. Or yeah, I thought about that. But they're not giving a direct answer to the advice itself. They don't have to say, yes, I will do that or no, I won't. It's, it's a very gentle, I think, right? So have you considered taking a cooking class would maybe be some suggestion or advice that you could give to someone who's in a particular situation where they're looking for something to do. They're bored. Have you considered taking a cooking class? That might be fun. No, I haven't thought about that. Let me think about that. Okay. And that's it. That's the end, right? So the, the great thing about it is you're leaving them so much room. If I were in your shoes, I would. Or if I were you, I would. Now, if I were in your shoes, I would. Feels to me a little bit more gentle than if I were you, I would. If I were you, I would is slightly pushier, but I think still fairly polite. The idea here is that you're showing the other person you understand their position. Being in someone's shoes is a way to say, I can picture myself as you in your current situation. And so I'm showing empathy in that way right? If I were you or if I were in your shoes. If I were in your shoes, I'd consult a doctor. I'd talk to a doctor. You're having some issue, right? Maybe your teeth are falling out or whatever. And you say, I, you know, I'm worried about this. My teeth are just falling out. <laughs> what should I do? Well, uh, you know, that sounds pretty scary. It's happened to me before in dreams, but not, not in real life. If it were, if, if, first of all, is this a dream? Let's pinch ourselves and check that, okay? Seems like maybe it's not, okay. Well, if I were in your shoes, I think I'd probably go see a doctor. Yeah, maybe I should. So it might be a way to push somebody to do something, but again, you're not forcing them to do anything. It's not pushy. 
and it's not insisting on anything. It's just saying, hey, this is what I would do. How about you might want to think about? This is just about as gentle as you can possibly be. It's a very soft suggestion. And, and you know, whether we're giving advice or suggestions, the, the line between those things is not clear, right? So if you're telling someone that they might want to consider going to this restaurant because they want to go to a restaurant and you're giving them a recommendation, a suggestion about which restaurant to go to, or they're having a problem, their teeth are falling out, or, you know, uh, they, their, their, water, their basement is flooding or whatever it is, and they need help and you need to give them advice. This is all good for any of those, whether you're giving someone advice for a problem or a suggestion or recommendation for something that they want to do or they are considering and they don't know which one to do. It all generally works, right? So you might want to think about joining a gym. That one, I suppose, could be context specific. Um, if that one is not prompted, then it would be considered probably rude. <laughs> if you just look at someone, <laughs> friend, and you feel like they're overweight and you just out of the blue say, you know, you might want to think about joining a gym. That would, of course, be rude for different reasons. But if you're being asked for advice, I'm trying to... I'm trying to lose weight. I'm running every day. I'm in my garage. You know, you might want to join a gym because they offer free classes. They have trainers. Having a little bit of financial pressure, knowing that you're spending money on the gym could motivate you a little bit. Might be a good idea instead of just working out at home. It's easy to just not do it at home, right? Especially if you sign up for classes. So there, you might want to think about is the opposite of pushy. Is definitely not pushy. Again, assuming that you're being asked that. In the same way, not very pushy as perhaps you could. It makes it an option, right? This is one option. Here's another option. Here's another option. And you could replace perhaps with maybe. Or you could just say you could. You can actually get rid of perhaps and maybe. The only difference is perhaps and maybe, maybe you could, perhaps you could, is more gentle is more polite, is less direct. And if you just say, you could, it's not that it's pushy or rude or anything. It's just uh, slightly less gentle, let's say. So perhaps you could discuss this issue, this matter with your family. See what they say. You're concerned about something and you're not sure who to talk to about it. You're worried if you say something to your colleagues that they'll, they'll judge you. So maybe... Maybe you could try talking to your family about it. They'll accept you no matter what, probably, hopefully, and uh, they might have some, some good suggestions, right? So I'm just giving you one option. And you can take it or leave it. For all of these, the feeling is, here's what I think. If you don't accept it, fine. If you do, great. I mean, no pressure. Okay. One option might be to, this one, in the same way, is just giving another one giving another one, give, an, give another thing that you could do. You could do this, you could do this. It's a way if you have a list of pieces of advice to bring up yet another. Maybe we've already gone through three and we've ruled them out because they're not working. And I don't want to keep saying, well, I think you could, or, or perhaps you don't want to keep saying, well, if I were in your shoes, you can only say that so many times. So finally, you want to just saying, what well, one option, one other option, another option, another option, another option. After you get to one, then you could just start saying another. Another option may be two. Another option would be two. Another option could be two. And you could just keep using those in depth indefinitely. One option may be to enroll in an online course. Ah, okay. I'm really trying to work on my English. You know, I'm struggling with the pronunciation and grammar. One option may be, eh, I'm no pressure, one option may be to enroll in an online course. I, you know, uh, I've heard there's a, a teacher who has a lot of online courses that may be uh, really helpful and worth worth checking out. You know, you probably you could probably find them on his website. Who knows? It's just one option. It's just one option. No, pr no pressure at all. 
Okay, now let's get into the di more direct ones. And when I say direct, I want to be clear. I don't mean rude. Okay, any of these can be rude in the right situation. Rude is context driven, right? It's like the gym thing. If you unprompted say to someone, you know, if I were in your shoes, I'd hit the gym right away. <laughs> Right, that's rude because of when and how you say it. So I don't want to say rude. I want to say the ones we've talked about are very soft and very gentle and not so direct. Now we're going to talk about ones that are a bit more direct. You should being perhaps the most, right? This is kind of like it's a very straightforward way to almost put your finger out point at them, and almost to say, if you don't do what I'm about to say, you're not smart. What I'm about to say is your best option. And if you don't do what I'm about to say, I will judge you, <laughs> right? That's the feeling of it, to be honest. Uh, now, there are times when you would use it casually, right? Well, you should do this and just quickly say something and, uh, it, you know, because I'm saying it quickly, it's not that pushy, right? Um, but it is often used in a kind of blunt way, right? Uh, sometimes you, you want to share something that you love in a blunt way. You should check them out. I just maybe found a new musician or a, or a band and I want you to listen to them and it's urgent. You should... You should check them out as quick as as soon as you can. They're they're the best, right? I think that you're going to to love listening to them. So maybe that's a friendship thing. Maybe that's just the relationship we have. So again, I want to say doesn't mean rude, right? It's just fairly straightforward. You should quit that job if it makes you unhappy. Why are you doing something you don't enjoy? If you don't enjoy it, stop. You should quit. Uh, and and that could be a good thing. I'm trying to encourage you to do something that I know you actually want to you want to do, right? Why don't you? Why don't you take some time off? I can see you're stressed. Why don't you do that? Now, this is not ask, asking you why. It's saying that you should. So it's similar to you should. It's fairly direct. And it's giving a suggestion in a way that pushes a little bit without being rude. Uh, why don't you take some time off? Why don't you go on a vacation? You know, why don't you call in sick today? You need a mental health day. Obviously, you're you're very stressed. Uh, everyone everyone needs one sometimes. Uh, you know, uh, there I maybe I'm concerned about your health, your overall well being, and I want you to do this because I see that you're not doing it for yourself. So I'm I'm trying to push a little bit. I recommend. Now I recommend again for advice. For suggestions, recommendations, I feel strongly about it, right? I recommend, particularly, saying you're sorry immediately. If you did something wrong, don't try to hide from it. I recommend saying you're sorry, getting it over with, and and then moving on. Because if you don't mention anything, if you don't say anything, it could create this awkward feeling between you, right? So just say you're sorry. That would be the most direct. I don't even say you should. I just say directly the action that you need to take. Say you're sorry to her or him. Say you're sorry. That's very direct. I recommend is similar, except often, if it's an action, saying would be an ing. I recommend doing. I recommend saying. It doesn't have to be. You could say, I recommend that you say you're sorry. I recommend that you go to this restaurant or visit this hotel when you're in this city, right? So it could be that, it could be ing, but it is kind of a, a way of saying this is a thing that I feel strongly about. And yes, you can say no, but I do feel strongly about it. And you need to know that, right? If you know what's good for you, you'll, for example, if you know what's good for you, you'll apologize. So similar to our previous example, this would be a great structure for giving advice, and it doesn't have to be if you know what's good for you. That is kind of the idiomatic version of it, where there's a common expression people use. If you know what's good for you, you'll 
apologize. If you know what's good for you, you'll usually you're giving some advice to someone about something to do right now, right? If you know what's good for you, you'll take a week off and relax because you're obviously very stressed, right? So that's one way to do it. But you can put other things in there, right? If you want to do this, right? If you want to explore your passion, you'll have to quit your current job. You need to quit your current job, right? If you want to become a professional roller derby referee, is that what they're called? You'll probably have to leave your current job. And I think you should. So you're kind of setting up this as an if this is what you want, do this. If this is what you want, do that, right? So it's very useful because you can put all kinds of other things in there. Very, very helpful. Again, another way to say this is it's best to. That's pretty direct, right? This is often when we're in a context, we're talking about a particular thing already, and I'm adding instructions based on my experience, perhaps. So woodworking. You know, where you, you, I'm a, I've been making tables for 10 years. You're just getting into woodworking. And I say, well, it's best to, you know, uh, source materials from a reputable uh, dealer so that you don't end up with something that's going to split in half halfway through your project, right? So I'm giving you my personal advice based on what we're talking about. And yes, that is fairly strong, right? I'm giving you basically a guideline or a rule to follow, but it is based on my advice. I want you to hear it so it's more direct. It's not like, a, well, man, it might be a good idea. I could, If I said it might be a good idea to a source from a reputable dealer, then it's almost like I don't care. You know, you, if you do or don't, it doesn't matter. No, it's best to do this. I have a lot of experience. You're just getting into it. You should probably follow my suggestion here because I know what I'm talking about. So I'm saying very clearly it's best to do that, right? That's kind of the difference between these examples and the previous ones we were talking about. So hopefully these are all clear. Hopefully you're maybe taking some screenshots of the examples throughout. What I'd like you to do is Try to make some examples yourself. If you really want to practice these and remember them, see if you can build examples like I did in a simple sentence as a way to interact with what you're learning. It's one thing to just hear something or see something and passively learn it. But are you going to remember that? I don't know. Maybe you have an amazing memory. But if you participate by making a few of your own examples, then you're more likely to remember it and you're more likely to remember how to use it. So feel free to share those examples with me in the comments if you haven't done so already. Don't forget to like and subscribe and also get a free course, Natural English Conversations, in the links in the description. Okay. I should clean my room. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. Perhaps you should learn more English. Yeah. I should clean my room. I need to clean my room. Look at this. It's a mess. It's a mess. I don't know if it's obvious, but I actually... So, obviously, uh, hopefully, obviously, this is a... Not a real room, but it's a digital room, right? Uh, as you can see, it is a digital room. Right, 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 right. And one thing that I did to try to make it look more real was I made the farther away things more blurry than the n more nearby things. I don't know if anyone has noticed this, but I, I did spend quite a bit of time trying to figure this out. So I found a, a, a room that I like using Midjourney. Uh, I made a room using Midjourney. And then I, I know it's just an example, but now I'm talking about it. And then I used Photoshop to blur the stuff far away. But then if you see, if you look at the sofa here, 
If you look at the plant on the left and the sofa on the right, it's more clear. So hope, I'm trying to create a sense of depth to make it feel a little bit more immersive. But yeah, I, I realize that, uh, Miriam, you were just making an example. I'm using both tools to learn English. Nice. Mary McCain says, the intonation is very important when reading to children. I like your rhythm and intonation. I've experienced this in the classroom environment and in interactions with adults that give unsolicited advice um, with adults that unsolicited advice end up underappreciated. It's a tricky job. Yeah. Yeah. Unsolicited advice, generally not such a good move. You're in the matrix. Yes, I am in the matrix. Well, sometimes I do it in my real room, but uh, it's kind of just a big empty room right now. I moved into this house at the beginning of 2022. A lot of decoration happened in the house, the living room, the bedrooms. But this room remains totally empty. <laughs> It's utterly undecorated from day one. Is it just a big empty room? So just haven't bothered. You know, it's hard to choose how to decorate it. Better to be empty than decorated in a bad way, right? I don't trust myself. I don't trust myself. All right. Well, if there are any questions about anything, I don't know if I missed any, but um, if there are any questions about grammar or idioms or pronunciation or whatever, feel free to ask. And otherwise, I think we'll call it a day. So I think I'm going to go out for a walk. It's a fairly nice autumn afternoon. And I think it would be nice to go out for a walk, take the baby out on the with the stroller. It's apple picking season out here. So in this area, one of the big things is there are a lot of orchards. And so people come from the city and they drive up and they come up to pick apples. And uh, it's pretty cool. They have pumpkins and hot chocolate and pizza. It's nice. All right. Well, friends and neighbors, I think we'll just call it a day then in that case. Thank you all for watching. Thanks for being here try to be regular on Sunday around this time around noon on Sunday okay so keep that in mind I will also keep that in mind and try to be here at noon on Sundays noon on Sundays I'm talking to myself more than anyone else if you haven't already you can uh, listen if you prefer to listen if you're listening you can watch listening in the links in the description watching in the links in the description Miriam says, I love this lesson and your explanation. Thank you a bunch for your effort. I'm happy to help, Miriam. See you next week, hopefully. And Mary, Miriam and Mary. Thanks, Luke. That was a great time. Have a good one with your son. Have a good one as well, Mary. I hope you have a good one too. What's going on this weekend? Anything cool? Anything good? Anything exciting happening? Anybody doing anything cool? If you haven't already done so, of course, hit the like button. That helps with the algorithm. Mm, what else? You can check out the yearly membership. As I mentioned, I recently added three, four new courses to the membership at no additional cost. Meaning, if you're a member, now you have access to four new courses that weren't there before. So membership and it's 30% off the yearly membership monthly. So for all of those 12 months, it's 30% off. Did I say 30? Yeah, I think it's 30. That sounds right. Wait, let's see. Let me, can I just double check this? Give me a second. 
Let's just double check. I just need to make sure this is working correctly. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So here it is. Just quickly. So this is the, you can do the yearly membership as one yearly membership. That's the cheapest option. Or if you want, you can do the monthly membership, very low commitment, right? So you can cancel any time, uh, but it's 30% off for 12 months, if that makes sense. So for those first 12 months, it's 30% off each of the 12 months, not just the first month, if that makes sense, right? And here are all of the... Um, Courses included Master Native English, Advanced American English Pronunciation, uh, American English Pronunciation, uh, American English Fluency, Building Your English Brain, Customer Service, English Essentials, uh, Job Interview English, uh, Common... Uh, no, there are... I got to update this. There are more now. I didn't update these with the latest ones. There's four more. There's four more courses. Four more. I, I need to update this. I forgot to update the, the list. Okay, so this isn't even all of them. All right. Anyway, thanks, everybody. I hope you have a good weekend, a safe weekend, a fun weekend, a relaxing weekend. Or if it's not the weekend, then whenever it is, I hope it's fun, safe, and relaxing. Hope to see you in the next one. Thank you for joining. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And uh, have a good one. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.